All right, let's now take a look at how we can implement a convolutional autoencoder in PyTorch. So um, I have like always a couple of helper functions, which I will go over later. Let me hide this view so we have more space in the center for the notebook here. So we start as usual by importing watermark so you know which PyTorch version I used. We are later also going to use matplotlib for visualizing some outputs and also the training loss as usual. So the helper functions are some related to plotting. Um, the data loader is exactly the same that we used before and this is the deterministic setting that we also used before. I slightly modified the training function. I will show you the modification later, but except that, um, yeah, I try to keep it very simple. So we are going to yeah train for 20 epochs, batch size of 32, just some settings here. Um, here I'm getting my data set. Now notice we are not using any validation data points. We don't uh, compute anything like accuracy here. So here we are only looking at the reconstruction between the input and outputs. And for that, we just use the um, yeah, training set. So yeah, just testing that the data loaders work. You can notice the validation set is empty now. Um, yep, so here that is our main model. In fact, okay, these are some helper functions for my main model, but um, yeah, here, these are my main my main ones. So I think yeah, you can see that. So here, this is my autoencoder class. I will explain the other functions in a few moments, the other classes I showed you. So we are implementing our autoencoder using two sequential parts. That is because that makes it later easier to reuse the encoder as a feature extractor and to use the decoder as something where we can reconstruct images from a latent representation. So I like to keep those two separate. Um, it's easier to read in my opinion, but also in that way we can use them in a certain way, uh, as you will see later. So here I just implemented convolutional layers, a couple of them. So going from one channel to 32. So the MNIST has only its grayscale, so we only have one input channel. I go to 32. Um, kernel size 3 by 3, that's just the usual stuff. Then I go from 32 to 64, and then I have just two convolutional layers um, that keep the channels. You could probably increase the channels. This is just um, reducing the size by 2. This is not doing anything except having more parameters in my network. Might be redundant, you could be able to remove that. Then we are flattening this. So this is, I don't know exactly the size, but this is something times something times 64, which is um, yeah then reshaped, flattened into a linear layer. So it will be all combined into one dimension like you are familiar with before from convolutional networks. So in this case, we get a 3136 pixel vector as the output from here. And then I'm compressing it into a two dimensional space. So only two hidden features. It's very small. This is, um, let me go to my slides. So this is here, here. So this is the fully connected one, but um, for some reason I, I should have probably put something in here. So this in between would be only two, two pixels, two dimensional. Okay, um, go back. So this is my encoder going from the 784 pixel MNIST to a two dimensional representation. So we are reducing the size here by 392, by a factor of 392, which is actually very impressive in my opinion. Um, and then we have the decoder and the decoder goes backwards. So it takes the two dimensional here, the two dimensional representation and projects it into a 3136 dimensional representation. And then I'm reshaping this so that it has yeah, the dimensionality of the convolution as before. So here the output now I remember. So the output here would be seven times seven times 64 or 64 times 7 times 7. 
So 64 times 7 times 7. That's where we get this value from. Oops. And now we are going backwards. We're going from 3136 to 64 times 7 times 7. Then I have my transpose convolution. Nikki Relu transpose convolution. So here I'm essentially with this one, I'm undoing this one, with this one I'm undoing this one and so forth. And then I go from 64 to 32, like the opposite of this one. And then I have the opposite of this one. However, um, due to how things work with padding and everything, I tried to get a 28 by 28, tried different paddings and thinking about it, where to pad and it didn't work out. So what I get is either something like 27 or 29. I'm not able to get 28. It's just because of rounding in the padding. Um, so this is why I have this trim class. So this trim class I implemented here is just removing one pixel. So from 29, it's trimming it to 28 in that sense. So I'm going from 29 to 28. So I have the original size as my input. And then I have a sigmoid here to get a pixels in the range 0, 1, because um, I'm not showing it here, but by default, if I don't use anything, the input images, let me go maybe to my helper data loader function. Yeah, so by default, if I don't specify the train transform in my, um, this is actually um, Cypher 10, MNIST. So here, if I don't specify anything for my train transforms, I will just use this one. And as you know, it will normalize the uh, pixels into a zero one range. And I want to compare my input to my output pixels. So I also want my output pixels in a zero and one range. As, as you know, sigmoid will accomplish that. So if you alternatively normalize your inputs, for minus one to one pixel range, you could use a 10H function here technically. Um, okay, and then in the forward method, I'm just defining my encoder and decoder. So just um, putting together what I have here. And then I'm initializing it. I'm using Adam here for simplicity. And then I'm calling my train function. Let's take a look at this uh, train function. So, okay, this is um, from the previous um, lectures, the train classifier. Now we have a slight modification. I can't, hmm. let's do it like this. So the train autoencoder function is almost identical to this train classifier function, except of course we don't compute the cross entropy loss, we compute the uh, mean squared error loss. So I have a MSE here if no loss function is specified. Some people like to train autoencoders with a binary cross entropy, but I don't I, I don't like this idea because it's not symmetric um, in any case. So if you have questions about that, I'm also happy to discuss this more in Piazza. I have some visualizations to show it to you, but uh, I don't want to make the lectures too long. If you're interested, I can show it to you, but it's not essential. So we have now the mean squared error loss here by default if we don't specify anything. And this is between the logits and the features, right? So we don't use any class labels. That's the main difference compared to the classifier. Here we are comparing the logits, which are the reconstructed images with the original images. All right, so this is all that's new. All that boilerplate here is the same as before. It's um, just for, except that we don't compute the accuracy, of course, we are just computing plotting the loss. We don't have any accuracy here. And yeah, this is essentially it. It's a pretty simple training function. It looks maybe more complicated than it is, but it's just the classifier function simplified. All right, so now here I'm training it. So you can see there's a big jump and then it only trains slowly. So the first iteration already minimizes it a lot, which is good. So it trains like for eight minutes on a GPU. Um, and then here's a loss. Maybe I can see maybe training it longer would have helped a little bit, but yeah, I was lazy, just trained it for eight minutes. And you can see the results look quite blurry. So you can, so at the top, so here I have a function on the, in the top row, these are the original images and at the bottom are the reconstructed versions. And you can see 
it's all very blurry. So why is that? Why is the quality so bad compared to what I showed you here? So the reason is I'm using only a two dimensional representation here. I actually forgot what I used. I used something higher dimensional. So here for the fully connected one, I used a 32 dimensional. I think I did the same thing for the convolutional one here. Um, so here I just want to see what happens if I use a two two dimensional one. It's an extreme reduction. So it's kind of impressive that it can reconstruct anything at all from just two pixels, right? But then you can also see it um, makes mistakes here for the four. It also thinks it's a nine because four and nine are sometimes very similar. And yeah, so it's not perfect. You would get much, much, much better results if you would, for example, change this number here. If I go up, if you change this number, let's say to 100 or let's say 64 and 64, you would get much better results. I just wanted to show you the extreme case of having two because a two dimensional space we can visualize. Okay, so because I have some more visualizations. So this is how the reconstruction looks like. Now here I have a visualization of the two dimensional space, the embedded space for all the training data points. So you can see um, it's kind of a mess, <laughs> but what you can see is that similar numbers cluster together. So I have added the class label information by color. So you can see the oranges here are all the, all the ones. The dark blues are all the zeros and they all cluster together because yeah, they are somewhat similar and the autoencoder is able to capture this um, similarity in this two dimensional space, which is kind of interesting. But you can also see that for for example, um, some are overlapping eight and nine. You can see they are overlapping here. Um, the three is also buried somewhere here. So it's, it's not great. So certain things are overlapping a lot. So in that way, if you sample a data point here where things overlap, well, it's unclear which one it would reconstruct, right? So in that way, it loses the information between these classes. It can also maybe then help explain. I think the four might be also buried here. It might explain that if we have a four here, it reconstruct a nine because they are overlapping here. And in the next lecture, we will talk about variational autoencoders, which fix this problem a little bit better. So there will, it will be a little bit better organized in this space. Um, yeah, and here I'm just using the decoder. So maybe I can show you the plot latent space function uh, briefly. So that helps you understand maybe how I, I did that. Um, so that is plot latent space. So here I'm technically just uh, using a data loader, iterating over the data loader. And here I'm using only the encoder. You can see model.encoder based on the images. So features here are the images from my data set. And then I'm, I'm producing these embeddings. And then I'm here is just some plotting code for plotting these two dimensional embeddings. But here, see, I'm only using the encoder part. And if I go back here, here, I have another visualization here, I'm using the decoder part. So what I'm doing here is I'm reconstructing an image. So I'm taking one point here, let's say 2.5 minus 2.5. So if I go here, it should be somewhere here in the center. And you can see it reconstructs this nine here from a from from this vector. So this is my input vector and it will reconstruct the nine. I'm just sampling from here. So here it looks like a pretty dense space, but you can think of it as um, that we have now a method for reconstructing or generating new data. So I could sample any point here, any I put, can put in some random values and by inputting these random values, I will be able to generate data. And if I take something that is not in my data set, like a point here, it, I actually don't know what will happen. It will create some data. I wish I could show you now, but I would have to run this on my laptop. This will probably take more than 20 minutes. But yeah, if you're interested, you can just put in some random values as a homework exercise or something and see what comes out. And you will see the results won't be great. And you maybe get some fantasy numbers that don't exist. And in the next lecture, um, we will see a better method for doing that. There's a concept called a variational autoencoder. So here, this is just the basic introduction. In the next lecture, I will show you a modification of the autoencoder, which is better at 
um, or is more designed for sampling from a certain distribution to generate new data. All right, so this is it for this code example. In the last video, I will go over um, some other types of autoencoders and then we will end this lecture for today.